Hey everybody, welcome to Online Sunday School. Uh, we are studying the book of Daniel and uh, we, we don't have many weeks left in the book of Daniel and I've been excited about coming back into this. I know if you've watched any of the previous episodes, I've shared with you how much Daniel, uh, the book of Daniel meant to me as a young person and how much it continues to mean. And there's, there's a reason God included this in his holy word. So guys, my name is Mark Smith. I'm glad you've joined me today. I hope you've had a really good week um, Pam and I are getting over COVID and um, so much better this week than last week. So uh, for those of you who've prayed for us, thank you so much. And uh, we're continuing to pray for so many of you. I know there are a lot of requests out there right now. And um, a lot of you are, are going through different things and um, we're continuing to pray for you. And what an appropriate lesson today, just, just with that particular segue. Um, and we're going to be in Daniel 6, verses 10 through 24, trust exhibited. Believers can trust God in all circumstances. So no matter what it is you're going through, uh, God's got this. And uh, what, what a great and comforting uh, line that is, and what a great and comforting truth that is. So let's go ahead and let's start with, with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this day. Father, I thank you for the warmth and for the sunshine and for the grace and for the forgiveness that you offer through your son, Jesus. Lord God, I just uh, I thank you for all the gifts that you give us. Father, most of all, I thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. Father, I pray that as we go through your word today, that Father, you would just give us discernment, give us wisdom, that Father God, we can not only understand what it is you're teaching us, but we could apply that in a way that would bring glory to you. Father, I just pray each of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I don't know if you all can hear that. It sounds like a dinner bell to some, but that's my dog in the background drinking out of her bowl. So, uh, normally she's real quiet during these, but she's really thirsty. So, anyway, let's, let's go ahead and get into today's lesson. And let's play it from the start. I already told you the, the title and the subtitle and where we're going to be studying from. So, just as an introduction. So, who are the people in whom we place the most trust? Who, who is it you trust? And I think for a lot of us, especially when we think back to our childhood, we trusted our parents and we knew that they had our best interests at heart. You know, and, and guys, even saying that, I know many of you did not have the same kind of childhood that I did. I have been blessed and I'm very aware of that. But even though my parents may have angered me or they may have punished my brothers and myself, we knew that they loved us and we trusted them. And, and the same thing can and should be true in a marriage. And nobody knows me better than Pam. And I trust her to have my best interest at heart in, in all instances. And she'll tell me. And, you know, what a great blessing it is also that she helps me drive uh, when I don't know what I'm doing. So, man, what, what a great help that is. So anyway, um, what happens to trust as we spend more years in those relationships? So again, I'm very blessed. I'm very fortunate uh, in that my parents uh, are still doing so well. I get to talk to them several times a week, and um, we, we have a stronger bond now than we ever have. I see them differently. And obviously, uh, hopefully they see me differently than they did when I was 10 or, or younger than that. So that's a different relationship today, but hopefully these relationships grow. And I know many of you have been hurt and, and you've had your trust broken. I understand that. But as I look at my parents and I look at other couples in my life, you know, and I think about Neil and Dorothy Park, uh, They've been married for so long, and I'm heartened by the trust that they have in one another. And that is such an important part of any relationship, that there be trust. And, uh, man, and how uplifting that is to see that in couples that have been married for, for so, so long. So can we be assured that the trust we place in others will never be broken? Can we do that? And we'd like to say we can do that. And we take vows to that effect. But only when we trust completely in God. You see, people are sinful, prideful, selfish. But you see, God is true. 
He's selfless and he is always trustworthy. He never lets us down. And you may say, well, you know, what about you and your wife? Well, I just probably let her down when I had that little dig with her helping me drive. So, um, but, but anyway, God will never let us down. We can always trust in him. He is always trustworthy. People are not. And, and it's sad, but it's true. All right, let's, let's go ahead and look at the background of today's scripture verses and, and today's lesson. So uh, Daniel is already, or in already, serving his third king in Babylon, all right? This time it's, it's Darius or Darius, all right? So he, he has served uh, Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, or Belshazzar, and then uh, now he is serving the Persian king as uh, the Babylonian empire fell, as was prophesied by Daniel. So as with the other kings, Daniel had proven himself to be trustworthy, loyal, and an efficient administrator in this kingdom. Consequently, others hated him, all right? And they wanted him out of the way. They didn't like the fact that this Judean slave, basically, this just Judean exile, he was captured by the Babylonians. Now, all of a sudden, he's risen to great power within the kingdom. They don't like that. They, they want to see him brought down, not just a notch, but several notches. So a group of these men devised a way to get the king to sign a decree ordering that no other gods be worshipped under threat of death. And the king agreed to that. And that's where we kind of pick things up at this point. So uh, we'll start with Daniel 6, verses 10 through 14. When Daniel learned that the document had been signed, he went into his house. The windows in its upstairs room opened towards Jerusalem, and three times a day he got down on his knees, prayed, and gave thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel petitioning and imploring his God. So they approached the king and asked about his edict. Didn't you sign an edict that for 30 days any person who petitions any God or man except you, the king, will be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, as a law of the Medes and Persians, the order stands and is irrevocable. Then they replied to the king, Daniel, one of your Judean exiles has ignored you, the king, and the edict you signed, for he prays three times a day. As soon as the king heard this, he was very displeased. He set his mind on rescuing Daniel and made every effort until sundown to deliver him. All right, so a trap has been set. So how did Daniel react to this new edict signed by the king saying that no other God and no other man could, could be uh, uh, prayed to or spoken to during this 30-day period? How did he responded by continuing to worship Yahweh the same way he had done before. This is important. He continued to worship Yahweh the same way he had done before. You see, he didn't go into the town square where he had all sorts of witnesses and openly defy the king's orders. He didn't do that. But he also refused to stop worshiping God and spending time with God. He refused to give that up. You see, Daniel's time with the Lord was between he and God, and it was not meant for others. But at the same time, and I think this is equally as important, even though he wasn't going into the town square and openly defying the king, he wasn't hiding either. If he'd have been hiding, he'd gone in there and he would have closed his windows and he would have silently prayed to his God, but he didn't. He didn't hide and he didn't, uh, uh, boldly and brashly disobeyed the king. So how did the men find out about Daniel's disobedience to the king? How did they discover that? Well, they were watching for it, right? They had set this trap. That's what you do. If you set a trap, you go check and see. Like I, in my garage, I have some mouse traps. I check them periodically. All right, so they had set it a trap for Daniel because they wanted Daniel punished. In fact, they wanted Daniel dead. They just didn't want him punished. They wanted him dead. 
So was Daniel too proud to recognize that he might be a target? Is that why he was so vulnerable here? Because his pride, I mean, here he had risen to one of the single most powerful men in all of the Persian empire. Guys, this is a powerful empire and Daniel is a powerful man within that empire. Was he eaten up with pride? Did he think that he was above the law? No. He was too loyal though to God to worry about that. You see, he trusted God to handle whatever may be. And, and he knew what the punishment was. He understood that wholeheartedly. So did the men drag the guilty Daniel before the king and then accuse him there? Is that what they did? Did they drag him out there and say, here's Daniel, look what he did. No, they didn't do that. Again, they're very deceitful. They waited for the king to assure them that he had signed that edict that would convict Daniel. Again, guys, they're playing this. They've set this trap, all right? As soon as the king said, yeah, I swore that and I signed that and, and there's a punishment that goes along with it, then they identified Daniel. Well, we found somebody and it's Daniel. He disobeyed the king. Guys, that is so deceitful on their part. Of what was Daniel guilty? What did he do? Did he speak badly of the king? Did he, did he claim that the king has no authority and no power? Is that what he did? No. He prayed three times a day to the one true God. That's what he did. That was his quote-unquote crime. I love this, though. What was the king's reaction to this accusation? What was his reaction to this? He was upset. He was angry. But not at Daniel. You see, he trusted Daniel. He didn't want to see Daniel harmed. In fact, he spent the rest of that day trying to figure out a way to save Daniel's life. So these men, and I don't, I don't know how many there were, but these men had set a trap, set a trap, for Daniel specifically, and they got the king to promise to send him to his death, and not just uh, any kind of a death, a gory death in the lion's den. For doing what? For praying. Guys, that really bothered the king. So why did Daniel place himself in danger of being executed? Why would he do that? And it was so that he could spend time with God. All right. Notice that verse 11 says that Daniel was found, hang on, the group found Daniel petitioning and imploring his God. This is an intimate time with the Lord and worth whatever inconvenience may come his way. Let, let me just share very quickly here, and, and I talk about this being an intimate time. Um, I pray daily, probably not three times that I set aside kneeling, facing anything, all right? But I pray daily. And one of the things that has meant so much to me in not only my life, but in my marriage is when Pam and I pray together. That's also an intimate time together that we share with the Lord. That's an important time. And I think that's such a blessing to our marriage. Well, guys, in the same way, we are to spend time with the Lord in an intimate way and learn to trust him more. As in any relationship that stands the test of time, our trust grows stronger as the evidence of trustworthiness is proven more and more each day. And we think about that with God. Who is more trustworthy than God? And you look at what Daniel has witnessed. Daniel has witnessed God protecting him over and over and over again and seeing his friends, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego being thrown into a fiery furnace that was so hot that the guards who threw them in died just getting close to the fire, yet they survived it. How? Unburned, they did it because God was with them. God is trustworthy. He proves it over and over again. All right, let's look at the next set of verses, and it's verses 15 through 18. <clears throat> then these men went together to the king and said to him, You know, your majesty, 
that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no edict or ordinance the king establishes can be changed. So the king gave the order and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, may your God whom you continually serve rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. The king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signet rings of his nobles so that nothing in regard to Daniel could be changed. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him and he could not sleep. Was the king able to save David? L let me rephrase. Was King Darius I able to save Daniel? No. The evil men knew what the laws were, and they knew that the king could do nothing once he had signed the edict. He was not above his own laws that could have prevented the execution of Daniel. Guys, they may have been evil, but they're lawful. They're following the, the letter of the law. All right. I'm reminded that as Christians, it's important that we do follow the law. Guys, our hearts have to be right as well. We also have to show mercy. We have to love others. And that's not what these men had in their hearts. They weren't looking to simply um, uh, carry out the law and carry out justice. Man, they didn't have love in their hearts. They had no mercy in their hearts. They were going after him and they used the law as a way to do it. So what words of the king spoke to the hope that he had? And I love these verses because this, yes, the king's God isn't Daniel's God. Yet he knew something about Daniel's God because he knew Daniel. You see, he knew that Daniel's God could save him, even though the single most powerful man in all of the Middle East, he himself could do nothing for him. He had tried to think of everything. I have no doubt that he even called in some of his other experts in the law and said, all right, what's, what's the workaround on this? And there wasn't one. There was nothing he could do. So he followed the letter of the law and he had Daniel thrown in the den. And a stone was rolled in front of the entrance and sealed with royal seals, his and the other nobles. What's this a picture of? Does, it, does this sound familiar to you? And I will refer to Matthew chapter 27 verses 59 and 60. So Joseph of Arimathea took the body, wrapped it in clean, fine linen, and placed it in his new tomb, which he had cut into the rock. He left after rolling a great stone against the entrance of the tomb. Because I, I don't speak for God here. I'm just telling you what, what I'm reading into this and the similarities that I'm reading into this. You see, stones were meant, these, these heavy stones were meant to keep them in. Daniel so that he couldn't escape. Jesus so that he couldn't escape. Do you see any other similarities? What do we know about death? And what should we take from these verses? All right, well, Yes, time has taught us that death is forever. People who've died, they're gone. Cultures have taught us that death is final. They don't come back. That's, that's what people teach us. But you see, God has shown us that death has no power over us at all. Time and again, we see examples of it, yet we continue to doubt, we continue to worry. You see, Jesus conquered the grave and as his followers, he has conquered it for us as well. Just like God did for Daniel. Guys, Daniel was put to his death in the lion's den. These were not pets. These were wild animals that were going to tear him to shreds. But we know that's not what happened. Let's look at the last set of verses, verses 19 through 24. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he reached the den, he cried out in anguish to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, 
I love that. The king said, has your God whom you continually serve been able to rescue you from the lions? Then Daniel spoke with the king. May the king live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths and they haven't harmed me for I was found innocent before him. And also before you, your majesty, I have not done harm. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to Daniel out of the den, gave orders to take Daniel out of the den. When Daniel was brought up from the den, he was found to be unharmed for he trusted in his God. The king then gave the command. And those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and thrown into the lion's den, they, their children, and their wives. They had not reached the bottom of the den before the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. What did the king do after having spent a sleepless night in bed? What did he do? At first light, he ran to the lion's den. And I'm reminded of Peter and John when they get news from the ladies that, that the tomb is open. The stone has been rolled away and that Jesus is no longer there. People had their doubts, but John and Peter, they took off sprinting. They wanted to see it for themselves. Guys, it may not be the same kind of trust, but I'm just convinced that the king trusted that Daniel's God, your God, my God, had done something to save Daniel. But the king was hopeful which is why he took off running. And he shouted out. He shouted out, Daniel, are you alive? Guys, how could it be that, that this, this king trusts Daniel's God? Why might the king have hoped all night long for Daniel to live knowing good and well it's impossible? How could he have hoped for that? You see, he may not have worshiped Daniel's God, but he did know the trust that Daniel had in Yahweh God. You see, Daniel's example of trusting in God influenced all of those around him. The same is true when we show our trust in God. People see that. And guys, they also see it when we don't. They also see it when we don't exhibit the kind of faith and the kind of trust and the kind of obedience that we're called into. What was found? So he was hopeful, took off running at daybreak. What was found? And then explain Daniel's response. Well, he, he found Daniel alive because he shouted out. He didn't see him, but he heard it. Daniel, are you in there? Are you alive? Did your God save you? And Daniel was alive and he was completely unharmed. But the first thing that Daniel does is he says, and I think this is interesting. He says, uh, then Daniel spoke to the king. May the king live forever. So he expressed loyalty and obedience to his king. But then he gave credit where credit was due. He said, my God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths and they have not harmed me. Because of his innocence. You see, <clears throat> Daniel praised God for his salvation. But he also declared his allegiance to the king and declared his innocence before God and the king. You see, Daniel was humble because he had done nothing worth praising. He'd done nothing. God deserves all the praise. I'll share a quick little story with you. I don't know how much time I've spent, but there was a, I was going to say professional golfer, but there was an amateur golfer in the 1920s. Uh, some argue maybe the greatest golfer to have ever lived, Bobby Jones. And uh, Bobby Jones never turned pro. He played his entire career against some of the best golfers in the world, but never turned pro. And uh, he was playing in the U.S. Open, one of the three majors at the time. And uh, he had hit a ball over in the rough, the higher grass, and he had got ready to, to hit the ball. And he, he stopped, and everybody was watching. And he turned around and he looked at his playing partner, and he said, the ball moved. His playing partner said, I, I didn't see it move. And nobody around, none of the spectators around had seen the ball move. But he did, and he called a penalty on himself. And as a result, he lost the tournament by one shot. And he was being praised afterwards. People had said to him, they said, Bobby, oh, what a great display of honor and integrity. And you're, you're such a, 
you're such a great man. And he said, you know, why are you praising me? I don't deserve this praise. He said, that's like praising someone for not robbing a bank. It was a sign of humility and we saw that, all right? God deserves all of our praise and we don't deserve anything, right? Isn't, isn't that true? You see, God deserves praise for all things that are good and we deserve horrible things for the sin in our lives. You see, he's the architect and author of all good things and as a result deserves our trust, our obedience and our praise. And we have to realize that without him, we're nothing. <sighs> you see, what's another outcome of this story besides God saving Daniel's life here? We see that those who set the trap and set them up, they were punished for their trickery and their treachery. Not only had they plotted to have Daniel killed, and I think we, we've seen that throughout these verses. Guys, they plotted to trick the king into doing it. And the king recognized that. And he made them pay. What was their punishment? And it seems pretty fair, even though it's harsh. The same thing that was devised, desi devised for Daniel was going to be their punishment. However, their families were also included it was going to be harsher on them. Has there ever been a time when your faith and trust in God has brought you some sort of vindication? Because we see in this, those who tried to set Daniel up and accuse him, they paid a price and he was vindicated. And he, he said that when he said that I was found innocent before God and before you, your majesty. He said that in verse 22. Yes, I hope so. I hope there's been a time in your life. Now, I don't hope that others died, all right? But I do hope that others were able to see that God is worthy of your trust and he is worthy of our praise because of your faithfulness. God wants to bless you and he wants you to know that he values your life so much that he gave his son to die on the cross. He did that for you and he did that for me. But as you can see in that picture, and as you can see just in the story that we read about Daniel, stone cannot, stones do not limit God's power. Right? Just as he raised his son Jesus, he can raise us. All right, guys, thank you all so much for joining me today. I hope you've enjoyed the lesson. Uh, I hope there's something in it that uh, gives you hope uh, as we go through these troubled times. Guys, miss you, love you, hope you have a great rest of your week.